Greetings in the name of God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ from the Tulalip Church of God. We want to welcome you to this Sunday's video as we worship and glorify God together. We want to encourage you in your walk with the Lord and share the good news of Jesus Christ. So sing along with the opening video and then be blessed with the conclusion of Pastor Sarago's sermon, Do Not Fear. The Tulalip Church of God's contact information will be available at the end of the video. God bless you. morning it's good to have you with us again today and I trust that everything is going well for you and your family and your household is healthy and you're growing in the Lord and love Jesus and those of you that may have come by YouTube by chance maybe you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior uh, we hope that soon you will ask Jesus to come come into your life and to forgive you of your sin like I needed to do and did do and he changed my life and made me a new person and when people say well what do you think you're perfect no I don't think I'm perfect but I know that I am different than I used to be because Jesus forgave me and he changed my life so if you're one of those persons that has not yet asked Christ into their hearts 
We trust that today, even before the end of this program, that you will ask Jesus to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sin. Jesus said every one of us needs to do that. And he wants to do that. That's why he died for us. But I want to continue, and this is part two of a message that I started last Sunday entitled, Do Not Fear. And I shared with you some things about the virus that we have gone through and we believe is winding down now. We've talked about how that God says to fear not. And there are a lot of things in life that we go through that are difficulties, and whether it's sickness or job-related, financial issues, whether it's family, relationships, or whatever, that we're to go to God, not fear them, but go to God, and He will give us peace. But there's a flip side to this coin, and that is that there is something that we should fear, and that is a good thing to fear, to fear those things that can destroy our soul. And if we will, just as we have learned when we were young, and I shared some illustrations last week of how that when you're growing up and a child and growing up in age, that there are things in life that you find out by accident that you never want to do again. Putting your finger into a socket, a light socket, which I did as a kid. Touching a hot stove or running out in between cars as a kid and getting hit by a car that you didn't see or look at, look for and, and you uh, neglected to listen to what your mom always told you. And there are th so there are things that we need to be conscious of. And you could say sometimes even actually fear doing because they're going to hurt us, not for a little while, but sin will destroy our soul forever, unless it's forgiven by Jesus. And so I dealt with some of that last week, and I read from 2 Timothy, and I'm going to read this again at the beginning of this message. 2 Timothy 3, beginning with verse 1, verse 1, it says, There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal. And this is where I left off last week, that there is a brutality in the world today. Not that it is new to our generation, but the level of brutality that is in America today is different than what we have seen in generations past. We've always had problems. We've even had some wars. But as a civilization, as a society, there were certain moral concepts that we have abandoned for today. And I could give you a whole list. But I just want to deal with two things, and I dealt with the first one last week, but let me just say that one of the first major moral changes that has taken place in the last few decades that has changed the landscape of morality in America is when we stopped fearing God about taking life. And the brutality of murder, the brutality of killing. And one of the ways that we have legalized the killing of people is through abortion. Sixty million babies have been ripped brutally out of the womb and killed through abortion. What a tragedy. This has set the course. We've, we have a lesser feeling and respect for life today because of this kind of thing. And so God is wanting to look, as a society, He's wanting to look at, at what we have created and where we are. And there are things in our life that we ne need not fear and just trust God to go with us through some things. But there are some things that ought to cause us great concern and great fear about where we're going. 
And here's a list that Paul gave. And I'm only mentioning two profound things. One is abortion. This should have never been legalized. In my opinion, and I believe the Word of God speaks, it addresses this clearly, that this shouldn't be done. And yet people are taking it so casually about choosing. The tragedy is once they do it, many, many women live with a guilt that until Jesus removes that guilt, they live with a guilt the rest of their life. Some maybe not as great as others, but many suffer a pain that they didn't know that they were going to experience and live with because of abortion. And so there is this problem in America that is greater than the virus, and that's the culture of sin. And as we look at that, we also look, it says, then the scripture continues in 2 Timothy 3. Let me continue to read what it says in verse 3. Not lovers of the good. In other words, he adds to this list that we have just read of the way that the culture will be before Jesus comes. And he says that they won't be lovers of the good. And in verse 4 it says, treacherous. And they will be rash and conceited and lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Let me stop for a moment and talk about the lovers of pleasure. There are all kinds of pleasures. And some pleasures are very accepted and good. And, and God wants us to in, in, enjoy certain pleasures of whether it's smelling a rose or whether it's being... A, with family or the pleasure of going on a vacation together. There are a lot of different kinds of good pleasures. They're not to consume our life. God should have first place in our life and doing His will, but there are good pleasures. But when pleasure goes to that which God says don't do, then we're in trouble and we better be afraid. For when we look at this thing about sexual pleasure of all kinds today. America has more or less, not everybody, again, there are a lot of people that are sticking with what God says when it comes to sexuality and, and the place that it has and the beauty that it has in a marriage between a man and a woman. But there is so much immorality today connected with sexual pleasure. And most of it is outside of marriage. And whether it's sexual per perversion, which the God so clearly speaks about in a number of places, and got to the place where the sexual perversion was so great, the immorality was so great. You can read the story of what God had to do to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he brought fire down and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because the wickedness was so great. We are seeing... Some of that in America today, where the wickedness is so great, you just wonder, Lord, how long will you be able to keep from dealing and, and, uh, and judging us for what is happening in this country? And so we look at this sexualness, sexuality thing, where the, whether it's pedophilia, whether it's perversion, whether it's... Uh, fornication, whether it's adultery or, or whatever, it seems like it is so consuming today in commercials, on TV, in the movies, or wherever. And all of the pornography that is out there today. All of these things, God says, these things are wrong. Don't do this. And then in verse 5 it says, Oftentimes these people have a form of godliness. But they deny its power. In other words, they're trying to live a religious way, but they're denying the, the power of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. In other words, they haven't been convicted of the sin and repented. They just live in an outwardly religious way. 
But inside there's no change. And God says, have nothing to do with such people. Of course, he wants us to have contact with those people, to talk to them about Jesus. But generally speaking, what he's saying here is that we shouldn't be comfortable being and spending a lot of time with people that are living in this way that Paul speaks about to Timothy. But we're, we're in this world, but we're not of this world, the Bible says. We're in this world not to participate with the sin and in the sin, but we're in this world so that we can reach out to people and say, God changed me through his son. I love Jesus. I want you to know him. I want you to love the Lord. That's what he wants us to do in this world. One day he's going to take us out of this world and those that love him. And this is what Paul is saying, in the last days, Jesus is coming back again. And I believe from what we see happening in the world and what the Bible says in numerous places, the coming of the Lord is going to be very soon. But until he comes, he's giving us an opportunity to do something about the sinful condition of our hearts and the sinful condition of, of our nation. America stands for some wonderful things. And there are some wonderful people in this country. And there are some things that I thank God for in America. And the freedoms that we have. To be able to worship the Lord. To be able to pursue our happiness and prosperity. I thank the Lord for these wonderful gifts that God has given us in this nation of ours. But at the same time, there's an aspect of our nation that has gotten so deadly in sin. And there's a part of our part of what is happening in this country that God wants us to repent of. God wants us to turn from it. And so there are some scriptures I want to share with you because there are times that we need to focus on something that is greater than just the immediate concern of a, a virus as important as that is to deal with it and get rid of it. But there is something even more important, as I said, and that is that we need to get rid of our sin and our rebellion against God. And we need to stop doing the things that are breaking the heart of God. And I want you to know too that some of these things that I've just shared, we shouldn't just flippantly say, yeah, that's true, I understand. But they should so touch our hearts that our hearts are broken, that we weep over America. The prophet Jeremiah He's called the weeping prophet. Why? Because Israel had turned to idols. Israel was burning their babies, throwing them as sacrifices. Israel had turned away from the true and living God. And Jeremiah, the great prophet, the weeping prophet, wept and wept and wept before God that his people would repent We need to do the same. We need to pray and be broken hearted and weep. There is still hope if we do what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If we come under this canopy of truth, these words tell us that when a nation has sinned so grievously in many different categories. And again, there are those that are watching and listening to this message that, that you love Jesus and you're wanting to do what is right. I ask you to do what it says here in 2 Chronicles 7.14 and those that aren't living as they ought to, you do 
what is said here in 2 Chronicles 7.14 as well. And if we do this, God will change us and do something beautiful in our country. I am praying for revival in America. I am praying for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in America. I'm praying that all of this sin that is going on, and some of it, some of it is extreme sin, will be repented of, and Christ will change us and forgive us and take it out of our hearts and make us new people. And so we read this in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And this is what we must do as Americans today because we're all aware that there are a lot of things going on in this world. And very possibly, this virus and this pause in our daily routine may be a way that God is trying to get our attention and say, now think about this. It may not only be because of whatever. Maybe God is doing something in our land to get us to really look at ourselves and to say there's got to be a change. And I'm concerned about the future. And what if I die? And what if this happens? And in the midst of these kinds of things, God oftentimes talks to people and says, I love you. I love you. And I want to come into your heart and I want to forgive you and change you. Let me read this in 2 Chronicles. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So speaking about believers and non-believers, if you will humble yourself, get on your knees, get on your face before God and pray. If you will seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive your sin and will heal your land. What a promise God is giving us if we will just do that. In 1 Kings, Solomon writes in chapter 8, it says, as he's praying before God, he's saying, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. He was serious. This is a very important time in the life of Israel. He was serious. God, I know. Please listen. Give attention to me. I'm crying out to you. Your servant is praying. When we pray like that, God hears us. There's also another verse that we find in Psalm 22. Verse 27 and 28. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him for dominion belongs to the Lord. And he rules over the nations. Now there is coming a time when Jesus will literally, when he comes back, rule over the nations. But even today, he is the ruler of but he allows us to go our own way if we choose to and sin. But he is saying, come back to me. One day I will physically be the ruler over the nations of the world. 
But now he wants to spiritually be the ruler of our hearts. Proverbs 14, 34 said, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns my people. It's a wonderful thing to live a righteous life. Righteousness exalts a nation. When people are living holy before God, that nation is lifted up. That nation God is proud of and loves and people honor. They see that they are a God-fearing nation. They see that they are a compassionate nation. They're trying to do what is right because they love righteousness. Righteousness exalts, lifts up a nation and makes it beautiful. But sin condemns the people. Proverbs 9.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So you see, there is a beneficial fear. There's some fear that will destroy you and hurt you. And God doesn't want us to live there. But he does want us to live in awe, respect, and fear of God. It's a good fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That's when you become wise. That's when I became, started to become wise. Not that I am so wise, but my thinking changed. When I realized I was breaking the heart of God, I was sinning, I was in rebellion. And I came to the Lord. And there was an awesome, good fear before you. Father, forgive me. I'm sorry. It was the beginning of wisdom. Because I knew, the first thing I knew was I had to repent. I had to ask Jesus to come into my life and change me. And he did. That kind of fear is good. It brings us back to our senses and a spirit of repentance. The prodigal son, the Bible says, when he was in sin, after he spent all of his inheritance, and he was living in a pig pen with the pigs and eating some of their husks and corn because he was starving. It says in the Word of God that that wayward son of that rich father came to his senses. I came to my senses years ago. All of us need to come to our senses. That we need help. And we need forgiveness. And we need Jesus. And our country needs to repent. Would you pray with me today, both for ourselves as well as for our country? You can bow your head wherever you are, and if you want to follow me or pray along with me as I pray. But in these last few moments of this service today, I want to pray. The Lord wants us to pray. My people will humble themselves and pray. Father, I ask you, Lord, that if there is anything in our hearts and lives today, if there's anything in my heart, if there's anything in anyone's heart that's watching this message, this program today, that grieves you, that is wrong, I am praying that you would forgive us. I'm praying that you would forgive me. That, Lord, that others out there watching would also say, Jesus, forgive me. And then, Lord, I know what you're going to do. You're going to wrap your arms around us. Just like that prodigal son that came to his senses and 
he made his way back to his father. And his father had been watching every day, looking out the door. Is my son coming home today? Is my son coming home today? Because his heart was broken that his son had left his house and left him. And Father, your heart is broken for those that have rebelled against you. You love them. But if they don't repent, there is nothing that you can do. Your justice demands that they must be judged. I pray, Jesus, for this country. I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you would forgive our sins. Lord, I repent in behalf of myself and our country. For there are things that we have done that are so grievous to the heart of God, your heart, that we should weep before you and pray and seek your face. And Lord, if we do that, and I am asking you now that you would bring conviction to our land, that people would feel the guilt of their sin, that they would want to say, Jesus, God, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me of my sin. I'm sorry, I know that something is wrong. And I'm asking you this morning to change me to forgive me. So Lord, we pray for our land today. We pray for America. We pray that we would come back to you as that prodigal son came back to his father. And his father put his arms around him and said, get a garment, let's have a feast. Friends, I want us to know that if America repents, if you and I repent before God and our hearts are made right with Him, He'll wrap a garment around us and He will give us such beautiful peace and He will give us that banquet and He will give us that feast because His heart is crying out for America to turn back to Him. That is our only hope. I ask this, Father, I pray this, and while we have this time, Jesus, at home, many of us still shut in or for a while, that we would use some of this time to spend on our knees and our faces before you, crying out for America. I ask you that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lose their power 